Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. Today we're going to look at our first lecture, Introduction and the Nature of Research. Here are three terms that you will see quite often throughout this course. Research, research methodology, and research methods. Do you know the differences between them? Let's take a look at what research is first. So what is research? There are many different definitions of research. Research may mean differently to different people. Here are two examples of such definitions. One, research is a systematic, careful inquiry or examination to discover new information or relationships and expand or verify existing knowledge for some specified purpose. The specified purpose of research refers to some problem of concern to the researcher or manager, which may be theoretical or practical in nature. Two, Research is a process of finding solutions to a problem after a thorough study and analysis of the situational factors. In other words, a good research aims to satisfy our curiosity on things that interest us and to provide information to guide decisions and solve problems. In short, research is an orderly way of obtaining new knowledge. Now that we know what research means, the next question is, why is research important? To answer this, we need to have the right attitude. The research attitude is well defined by the quote, Doubt is often better than overconfidence, by famous inventor and scientist Hudson Maxim. Why? Because doubt leads to inquiry, and inquiry leads to invention. If the researcher already thinks he knows the answer, he is merely doing confirmatory research. Quite often, this is what consultants do. If you are hired as a PR firm to promote the government's economic transformation program, for instance, what would you do? You will find all of the benefits of the ETP while perhaps keeping silent about its drawbacks. Many advocacy groups also do this kind of research. Now, this is not what academic research is about. Academic research requires an open mind, open to all possibilities, and an inquiring mind, willing to search for answers. And there is a difference between objective and motivation of research. Objective is what you want to do with your research, whereas motivation is why you want to do it. It is sometimes referred to as the rationale of conducting research. So, having the right attitude in mind is very important before we embark on research. So, let's answer the question again. Why is research important? Here are several of its significance. One, when we conduct research, we will have a better understanding of complexities in the world around us. Two, when we conduct research, it is basically the basis for decision making. We also conduct research when we need to solve problems. And when research is conducted, it will be able to give us building blocks to new knowledge. New knowledge provides benefits to mankind. For example, increase in food production, reduction in the workload of human labor, as well as the reduced crime rates in major cities. Besides that, we also conduct research to develop new theories or augment existing ones. And, um, well, last but not the least, research teaches us methods of discovery. Research teaches us investigative skills. It teaches us how to think critically. It teaches us logic. And research teaches the art of making good arguments. So we've already seen what research is and why it's important. Now let's take a look at the other two terms research methodology and research methods. What's the difference between them? To know the difference between research methodology and research methods, we need to take a step back and look at epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge in general. It's the science of knowing. It refers to how we can understand knowledge, how we can understand our own thinking process and how we think others know. Methodology is a subfield of epistemology, and it is the science of finding out. So, research methodology is the procedures for scientific investigation. Research methodology is basically the way to systematically solve our research problem. It is about how research is done scientifically. 
the very steps that are generally adopted by researchers in studying um, their research problems along with the logic behind them. Research methodology has many dimensions, and one of the dimensions of research methodology is research methods, which is the ways of conducting research. So, in short, research methodology is the general approaches or guideline to doing research, whereas research method is the specific details and or procedures to accomplish our tasks. Having known what research is and why it's important, as well as the difference between research methodology and research methods, now let's take a look at the different types and purposes of research. From the definitions earlier, we know that to do research is to investigate the problem systematically, carefully, and thoroughly. This requires the researcher to follow a process or a sequence of steps known as the scientific method. A study that adopts a scientific method is called a scientific research. So scientific research is basically a study that is conducted within rules and conventions of science based on logic, reason, and systematic examination of evidence. Ideally, within the scientific model, it should be possible for research to be replicated by the same or different researchers and for similar conclusions to emerge. How about us? As students in the field of social science, we engage in social science research. Is there any difference between scientific research and social science research? Well, yes and no. Social science research is a study that deals with people and groups of people and their behavior. And as you know, people are much less predictable than non-human phenomena. Therefore, in social science, the social world is constantly changing. So it's rarely possible to replicate research at different times or different places and obtain identical results. However, the purpose of research is to generate new knowledge. So in that aspect, both scientific and social science research serve the same purpose. And some social science may also engage in scientific method, particularly research in economics and finance, as research in these areas are also confined to following specific rules and use quantitative methods. Now, let us move on to the classification of social science research. Generally, research can be divided into basic research and applied research. Basic research, or also known as fundamental or pure research, stresses on the creation of knowledge, that is, detailed studies on theory. In social science, a basic research aims to expand knowledge of processes of business and management that results in universal principles relating to the process and its relationship to outcomes. Besides that, the findings of basic research is of great significance and value to society at large. Applied research, on the other hand, concerns with finding solutions to practical problems facing a society or an industry or a business organization and putting those solutions to work to a particular situation. In social science, applied research improves our understanding of particular business or management problems, resulting in solutions to the problem or new knowledge limited to the problem. Besides that, the findings of applied research are of practical relevance and value to the managers in organizations. Both types of research complement each other. Applied research will use theories obtained from res basic research, and basic research depends on the results of applied research in constructing complete theory. In addition to basic and applied research, Social science research can also be broken down into descriptive, explanatory, and evaluative research. Descriptive research is finding out or describing what is, for instance, the population census and surveys of household expenditure. They are conducted at regular basis to monitor social and economic change. Explanatory research explains how or why things are as they are. This is basically to seek to explain the patterns, relationships, and trends observed and discovered. The aim is to be able to say, for example, that there has been an increase in X because of a fall in Y. And in most cases, they use this explanatory research to predict demand, sales, impacts, etc. And finally, evaluative research evaluates policies, strategies, programs, and practices. 
It arises from the need to make judgments on the success or effectiveness of policies, practices, strategies, or programs. For instance, whether a particular practice or program is meeting required performance standards. Let's move on to research paradigms and approaches. So what is a paradigm? To put it simply, a paradigm is how we view the world. Specifically, a paradigm is a shared framework of assumptions held within a discipline or school of thought within a discipline, reflecting a philosophical belief about the nature of the world, the scientific problems which it presents, and the types of solutions that arise from the research. For example, let's take a look at people's views on abortion. To some, abortion is a medical procedure that should be undertaken at the discretion of each individual woman. To others, abortion is murder, and members of society should collectively have the right to decide when, if at all, abortion should be undertaken. Chances are, if you have an opinion about this topic, you are pretty certain about the truth of your perspective. Then again, the person who sits next to you in class may have a very different opinion and yet be equally confident about the truth of their perception. So, who is correct? You are each operating under a set of assumptions about the way the world works or the way you believe the world should work. Perhaps your assumptions come from your political perspective, which helps shape your view on a variety of social issues, or perhaps your assumptions are based on what you have learned from your parents or in religion. In any case, there is a paradigm that shapes your stance on the issue. Those paradigms are a set of assumptions. Your classmate might assume that life begins at conception and the fetus's life should be at the center of moral analysis. Conversely, you may assume that life begins when the fetus is viable outside the womb and that a mother's choice is more important than the fetus's life. Thus, a pro-life paradigm may rest in part on a belief in divine morality and fetal rights, whereas a pro-choice paradigm may rest on a mother's self-determination and a belief that the positive consequences of abortion outweigh the negative ones. These beliefs and assumptions influence how we think about any aspect of the issue. In social science, the terms paradigm and theory are often used interchangeably. However, they are different. And when you regard them as distinct, it will provide a useful framework for understanding the connections between research methods and social scientific ways of thinking. While paradigms are grounded on general assumptions about the world, theories describe more specific phenomena. Paradigms point us in a particular direction with respect to our why questions, whereas theories map out the explanation or the how behind the why. In social sciences, there are two main paradigms, that is, positivism and anti-positivism. Let's take a look at paradigms and how they shape a researcher's approach. As mentioned before, there are two major paradigms in social science, positivism and anti-positivism. A positivist paradigm emphasizes on observation and reason as means of understanding human behavior. According to this paradigm, true knowledge is based on experience of senses and can be obtained by observation and experiment. Positivistic thinkers adopt scientific method as a means of knowledge generation. Hence, it must be understood within the framework of the principles and assumptions of science. On the other hand, an anti-positivist or critical or interpretive paradigm emphasizes that social reality is viewed and interpreted by the individual him or herself according to the ideological positions that he or she possesses. Therefore, knowledge is personally experienced rather than acquired from or imposed from outside. So, how does the researcher's paradigm shape his or her approach to conducting research? The positivist paradigm leads to the quantitative approach, where the main objective is to explain or answer the question why. In quantitative approach, the usage of numerical data is common, and it often involves a large number of cases. This approach usually seeks to generalize the findings to the entire population. A quantitative approach is more objective in nature. This is because facts are objective. A number three, for instance, is a number three to anybody. There is no interpretation involved. 
What needs to be understood are magnitudes and the trends. The anti-positivist paradigm, on the other hand, leads to the qualitative approach, where the main objective is to understand or answers the question how. Qualitative approach often uses words and images. It generally involves a smaller number of cases and the findings are typically not generalizable. A qualitative approach is more subjective in nature because reality involves more than what can be observed. It includes emotions and attitudes which may not be reducible to numbers. Verbal communication and images can convey some of these unobservable attributes such as sadness and anger. The attempt is to look at multiple dimensions. Last but not least, positivist studies usually adopt deductive reasoning, while anti-positivist studies usually adopt an inductive reasoning. Looking at the philosophy of research, there are two broad approaches to reasoning, or the process of thinking. One is the deductive approach. Deductive reasoning works from the more general to the more specific. Sometimes this is informally called a top-down approach. It assumes that there is already a theory that needs to be confirmed or rejected. The point here is to use the data to prove or disprove the theories. Two is the inductive approach. Inductive reasoning works the other way around, moving from specific observations to broader generalizations and theories. Informally, we sometimes call this the bottom-up approach. The assumption here is that the theories are known, but through observation, patterns can be discerned which will lead to identification of the underlying theory. Through identifying these two distinct approaches, we can see the differences in the qualitative and quantitative approaches mentioned earlier. There are obvious benefits from combining both quantitative and qualitative approaches. However, in practice, genuine combination that gives equal emphasis to both is seldom attempted. This is due to the following reasons. First, to combine effectively requires deep knowledge of each type of methodology. Typically, a researcher is well grounded in one approach, but knows much less about the other. For instance, in economics, research has always been inclined towards quantification so that you are considered to be good only if you are able to understand and apply quantitative methods. So many engineers move into economics, giving the discipline such glorious terms such as white noise in time series. Second, while qualitative researchers have shown some willingness to try quantitative methods, the opposite seldom occurs. Perhaps by virtue of their training, quantitative researchers generally see little merit in using qualitative methods, which they see as unable to lead to clear-cut answers. Their world is more black and white, never shades of grey. Third, generally, a quantitative researcher would resort to qualitative methods only if it becomes impossible to use quantitative methods, and vice versa. This is partly due to familiarity and, of course, attitude. In this situation, it cannot be said that genuine combination has taken place. Now, having seen the definitions of research as well as research paradigms and approaches, which category do you think your research will be?